All right, so I want to thank everyone for joining us on this webinar today on the Israeli Voice, where Israelis stand on key election issues. My name is Evan Gottesman, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Communications at Israel Policy Forum. We're really pleased to be launching this program in partnership with the Union for Reform Judaism as the first of several webinars, which we're going to be conducting throughout the summer, leading up to the Knesset elections on September 17th. Two of the things that we really value at Israel Policy Forum are forthrightness and intellectual integrity, and it's our hope that these webinars will provide you with a clear-eyed appraisal of the situation uh, in Israel leading up to these elections. Today, we're joined by someone who is well-suited to provide just that kind of frank assessment. Professor Tamar Herman is the director of the Gutman Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research at the Israel Democracy Institute. She's a faculty member of the political science department at the Open University of Israel. And Professor Herman has co-edited the monthly Peace Index, now the Israeli Voice Index, since 1994, and edited the annual Israeli Democracy Index since 2010. She has taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv University, was a guest lecturer at Princeton, Queen's University in Belfast, and the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. Professor Herman, thanks for joining us. Hi, Evan. How are you, buddy? Uh, it's good to be with you, and I hope that we will have some better picture of what's happening uh, in Israel these days, at least on the political level. But I'll start by presenting to you uh, for a couple of minutes two new projects that we have at the IDI. The first one is the Israeli Voice Index, that uh, it's a new monthly survey. Instead of the Peace Index, we are doing it uh, on our own without the uh, Tel Aviv University. And uh, it's, as I said, it's a monthly survey. And you can find it on the IDI uh, homepage. If you want to subscribe, uh, there is an option there uh, as well. So you are most welcome to subscribe and get it uh, to your email every month. The second project, uh, which is even more ambitious, it is called Data Israel. It's a comprehensive web-based database of over 1,000 surveys from 1948 with full data for all surveys conducted by the Gutman Center uh, we have the full data only from uh, 1967, but we have all the reports since 1948. And it's very user-friendly. You can get there and, and, and find whatever data you want. You can have the SPSS files, but also the frequencies and all the questions in English and in Hebrew. And you are most welcome to uh, try and find what you were looking for. The topics for this uh, uh, discussion are actually four. I'd like to share with you uh, some data about Israel's overall situation and balance of achievements, main features of the political map. All these are, of course, as perceived by the Israeli public. What we are uh, talking about today is the Israeli public opinion, uh, not necessarily objective facts, but the way that the facts are being perceived by the public. And of course, these uh, perceived facts, they motivate people to take a certain uh, electoral decision or political decision or uh, uh, political actions. Then we'll talk a bit about the Israeli elections, the, round, uh, the two rounds. One uh, we had, uh, of course, the first we had in April, the second we are going to have, as even said, uh, in, in um, in September. Uh, I'll talk about uh, people's perceptions of the elections. I'll show some new surveys, not necessarily done by us, actually not by us, about the resu expected results for the, uh, uh, for the next elections. Uh, I'll talk a bit ab about how healthy uh, is Israel's democracy, uh, again, as perceived by the Israelis, Jews and Arabs, and a bit about Israel and Palestine, and where do Israelis stand on that? So we'll start with a very uh, uh, informative and, and critical uh, uh, slide showing uh, the answer to the question, uh, how do you assess Israel's overall situation? We asked the same question since 2003 to uh, uh, last April. 
and as you can see, uh, it's uh, an amazing phenomenon. We can see uh, a steady increase in the numbers of those saying that Israel's overall situation is good or very good. This is the blue line, right? You can see that uh, uh, right now, uh, 2018 and also 2019, we have over half of our respondents. It's a, a, a national representative sample, of course, uh, of uh, 1,200 people, both Jews and Arabs, all ages, of course, all, all parts of the country, all uh, religious uh, uh, subgroups and so on and so forth. Over a half define the state uh, uh, of the state as good or very good. Then you see that the uh, red line is going down. Uh, this says uh, that the number of those who think that the situation of uh, the state is bad or very bad. Obviously, uh, people's uh, uh, answers to this question are strongly correlated with their affiliation with a, a specific political uh, uh, camp. But in order to get over uh, 50 something percent saying good or very good, uh, we need to have also people of the center uh, and of course uh, the right saying that this is the situation. Uh, the 16 uh, percent saying that the situation is bad or very bad uh, are, are composed of mainly people who define themselves as being on the left, but also people who put themselves on the uh, radical side of uh, uh, the right continuum. They are dissatisfied or they think that the situation is not good for different reasons, but they share the, the assessment that the situation is bad or very bad. But the majority, as I said, think that the situation is uh, good. Now, uh, um, a couple of days before uh, last uh, Independence Day, we asked our respondents about Israel's balance of achievement. It was May 2019. And as you can see, uh, the blue parts uh, um, are saying that Israel uh, has had much more success than failure or somewhat more successes than failures. Only a few, less than 10%, think that Israel uh, had more failures than successes or much more failure than successes. The 9% who didn't know are composed mainly of Israeli Arabs. Uh, basically, in most surveys, we see that the numbers of Arabs who uh, opt for the don't know um, option is significantly higher than uh, amongst the Jews. Um, if people think that this is because they are afraid of answering our question, this is not uh, the case, because uh, sometimes we ask very, very difficult questions, and uh, difficult questions in terms of uh, that they do not resonate uh, well uh, with, uh, uh, with the, the interviewers, but uh, it seems that uh, it is not out of fear. It is not uh, even uh, social desirability motivated. This is because uh, uh, to a significant extent, some parts of the Arab um, Israeli public are actually detached of the mainstream uh, public discourse and therefore they uh, have no opinion on things. Sometimes we push them with their back to the wall. I mean, not physically, of course, right? Uh, we are just asking other questions in order to figure out that maybe it's the phrasing of the question. By the way, they are being interviewed uh, in, in Arabic uh, with the uh, um, native speakers of Arabic. So it is not uh, uh, the, the language that they don't understand. But some questions that Israeli Jews are constantly dealing with are thought of as too far uh, or, or irrelevant to the Arabs and therefore they say uh, don't know. Sometimes uh, it is very problematic for us to uh, find out uh, what are the main uh, uh, streams within the, the Israeli Arab public. But it is not out of fear the way uh, that it was, uh, say, 25 years ago where Arabs, and by the way, ultra-Orthodox Jews did not participate uh, in, in, in Sweden. Now, uh, uh, let's look, take a look at the uh, political blocks in Israel. This is critical. 
because as you can see, the numbers uh, are so different between one uh, uh, camp and uh, one block and all the others. Obviously, now it's 59%, uh, 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 but uh, in, in other surveys, uh, we uh, often get between 60 to 65% people who are defining themselves as being on the soft right and uh, uh, the right about one quarter between 25 to 30 percent uh, in various surveys um, define themselves as being in the center and only about 12 percent uh, sometimes in a good day 15 percent define themselves as being on um, the soft left and, and the left this is a critical graph to keep in mind because in the 1990s we spoke about two uh, almost equal uh, political camps, right? And uh, therefore, uh, their relative uh, uh, political strength uh, was quite similar, and the uh, electoral competition was real. But if you if you look at the numbers now, uh, uh, the difference between uh, the largest uh, uh, camp, the the camp of the right, and uh, the camp of the left, are such that we should adapt our uh, expectation of the left to have real influence on uh, the policy making or uh, even um, the construction of uh, uh, the next uh, government. Uh, one problem is that particularly people uh, from the outside who uh, uh, identify with the agenda of the left sometimes uh, by having very high expectations of the left, they put much pressure on a very small political block to get results which uh, uh, it actually cannot achieve. And therefore, we should calibrate our expectation of this uh, uh, quite small, um, quite small uh, uh, political camp. Uh, you may ask me why are we measuring only the Jews? We are measuring both the Jews and the Arabs, but uh, we put them separately because uh, almost all Arabs put themselves on the left, but they put themselves on the left not because they share, for example, the, the, the uh, social democratic agenda or uh, any other uh, economic and political views. Uh, because this is the only place on the political, on the Israeli political uh, um, uh, map where they can put themselves, but they don't see themselves as really part of the left. Because what stands between the uh, the Israeli Arabs and the Israeli Zionist left is the issue of Zionism. They see themselves of the left, but they do not share the Zionist commitment of uh, most of the Israeli Jewish left. And, and, and therefore, uh, there is an issue there that I'll address uh, a bit later that uh, is making it very, very difficult to create a Jewish-Arab uh, uh, coalition and even uh, just uh, a political alliance in which the Arabs will not be really part of the coalition but uh, uh, serve as a safety net for a center-left uh, uh, coalition. Now, uh, this is also some basic fact that you should keep in mind. When we um, look at the Israeli Jewish uh, uh, public in terms of uh, the various uh, religious group, the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, the religious, Haredi are about 12% now, uh, 11 to 12%. We are talking about 18 and above. The numbers are different for the entire population. Uh, religious are about 15%, traditional religious also 15%, traditional non-religious uh, 16%. This definition, uh, the, this division between the traditional religious and the traditional non-religious is done by the uh, Central Statistics Bureau and therefore we follow it. And the seculars are about 43%. But when you look, uh, at the top of the table, and you can see the division between left, center, left, center, certain right and right. You can see that in all groups, besides the secular group, uh, we have a clear majority among the traditional non-religion, just uh, a plurality 
who put themselves on the right. If we take together the center right and the right, then it's about 90% of uh, the ultra-Orthodox. Uh, the same goes uh, 85% uh, for the traditional Orthodox, 90% uh, for the religious. And uh, uh, the center is almost equally divided uh, uh, between the left and uh, center, left, center, right, uh, uh, center, right, and, and right. And this only uh, uh, strengthened my previous point that the right and the center right uh, is uh, uh, by far the strongest uh, uh, political camp in Israel as of today. Now there is a very interesting question of identity. Uh, in, in, uh, in, a, um, in a research project that we conduct every two years, we try to figure out uh, and ask people, what is your primary identity? Okay, we ask it in a format of uh, a closed-ended uh, question and an open question, uh, and, and the results were very, very similar. As you can see, among uh, the Israeli Arabs, uh, uh, the plurality preferred to uh, opt for uh, the Arab primary identity. Second, always comes the religious uh, affiliation, uh, this was even higher than the Arab uh, identity uh, during, uh, let's say, five or six years ago when things were very messy in Iraq and in Syria, and therefore uh, religion was more important than the Arab identity. Then the Israeli identity actually comes last with the Palestinian identity uh, getting about uh, 14 to 15 percent as a primary identity. This uh, uh, finding that was repeated by many other surveys conducted by Professor Sami Smofa and others in Israel is very upsetting for uh, the Arab community leaders because they put forward, uh, first and foremost, their Palestinian identity. And the gap that is uh, opened between their uh, primary identity and the results that uh, many uh, pollsters and, and analysts get from uh, the grassroots, it puts some uh, heavy pressure on the relations uh, between the grassroots and, 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 and the leadership. And indeed, uh, one of the answers why was the turnout amongst uh, uh, the Israeli Arab so low, 49% about in, in, in the April elections, it has to do less with uh, the Israeli Jewish politics and more with uh, the dissatisfaction of the Arab, um, uh, um, the Arab citizens uh, of their own leaders. Uh, for the first year ever this year, we got a majority of Arabs saying that they have no confidence uh, in the leaders and that they do not represent them well uh, uh, politically was more than one survey conducted by many uh, other uh, students of, of the subjects and, and, and the leaders are aware of that. It's a critical uh, uh, point to understand because sometimes people uh, attribute this decline in, in, uh, in the turnout in the last elections to the nation state law. Of course, this also had a negative effect on the willingness of Israeli Arabs to participate in the elections, but they have a, a much greater problem right now with their uh, uh, leaders. As to the Jews, as you can see, uh, in, in two years, we saw a decrease in the numbers of those defining themselves first and foremost as Israeli, an increase in the numbers of those defining themselves first and foremost as Jewish. This has uh, both to do with the very, very heated debate over uh, state and religion in Israel, but also because of demography. Because uh, uh, in, in recent years, we see more and more uh, young people um, uh, participating in, in uh, above 18, participating both in service, but also in the elections. And many of them are religious or ultra-Orthodox. Uh, and so these groups, obviously, uh, the Jewish um, identity is stronger than the Israeli one. The Ashkenazi-Mizrahi issue is almost uh, redundant. Uh, 
uh, and and uh, uh, the same uh, is with the um, division along the religious groups uh, lines. Now let's move to the elections. We had early elections in April 9th after a vote to dissolve the Knesset in December 2018. Uh, the right won, as you know, more seats, but Prime Minister Netanyahu was unable to form a government. The Knesset voted to dissolve itself once again. No elections will be held in uh, September. In both cases, uh, the former cause uh, was the draft law and the initiator was member of Knesset, leader of the um, Israel Beitenu party, uh, uh, Victor uh, uh, Lieberman. Um, he played his cards very well, as you will see in a moment, and actually by the surveys, he more than doubled uh, the number of seats uh, uh, from uh, compared to the April elections if the surveys are correct about the, uh, the next elections. Uh, these are the results of the April uh, elections uh, in, in, in purple. And then you see two other surveys that were conducted by, uh, by commercial uh, uh, service institutes, May and, May and July. Um, in the first uh, round, uh, Barack, uh, didn't uh, get anything. Now the assessment is that he perhaps will be able to cross uh, the threshold. His uh, his party, uh, the name of his new party is Israel Democratic. Uh, Israel Democratic. Um, people are talking now about four or five, maybe even six seats, but it is quite unclear. Uh, if these are real results, because uh, the question is, will he join forces with labor or merit, both labor and merit or, or not? Um, Likud and Blue and White are, uh, are now the, the uh, still uh, the greatest and largest parties. Uh, a, a survey of yesterday, which I didn't put here, give them both 30 seats uh, in the next uh, elections. Shas uh, uh, stays as it was, United Torah Judaism, uh, the same. Chadash and Tal are the Arab parties uh, that uh, apparently will run together with uh, Balad and Ram, and, Ram. And, and, and they are expected to get between 12, 13, one survey even said 10. Uh, which means that the uh, uh, reunion between the two Arab parties is not bearing fruit anyway. Um, right now, it is all in uh, uh, under a, a big uh, question mark. Kulana, it's the party. This party uh, uh, is um, uh, the party led by Moshe Kahlon, the foreign foreign minister of finance, who joined Likud. They will run together, and this is why the two zeros. Not right. Uh, the new right, it's Naftali Bennett. He joined forces uh, now uh, very recently with Moshe Feiglin, the leader of the Zehut party who didn't cross the threshold in the April election. Both parties did not cross the threshold and therefore they are running uh, together now. The question is, will they join forces with the union of the right-wing parties or not? So we are in, in a, a time where things are not that clear and therefore I wouldn't rely on any survey now as a, a valid indication of what uh, will exactly happen in, uh, in September. Um, because the difference between the two largest parties is so small, every change, uh, uh, um, considering one of the, of, of the smaller parties, uh, may uh, uh, change the, the, uh, uh, the results of, of the elections. Right now, it seems uh, uh, that we could is uh, 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 will be more capable of, of being the focal party uh, of, of the next coalition. And it depends how uh, Lieberman, the leader of Israel Beitenu, who is getting now nine compared to five that he got uh, in, in the elections, how is he going to play his card? He says that he uh, will only join a unity government uh, between 
blue and white and uh, uh, Likud and maybe some other parties without the ultra-Orthodox parties. But who knows, uh, when the time comes, we will know to which extent this uh, statement uh, made by him are, are, are real or, or just uh, some kind of uh, uh, strategic uh, game. Now, uh, this is a, a critical uh, issue uh, that was um, put on the table only uh, before the, the last elections. Uh, after the 2015 elections, there were uh, some small groups of people who uh, argued at that time that uh, the election results published by uh, the government were not uh, the, real, uh, the real results. And uh, when uh, I suggested that we will try to figure out to which extent people really trust the results, that are published by the state. My team member said that this is not a question. Israel Israel is, is, is a solid democracy. No one is uh, uh, playing with the election results. Uh, there is uh, much uh, supervision of the counting of the votes and so on and so forth. Uh, however, I, I, I insisted on asking this question to which extent people trust the integrity of the election. And we were amazed to realize that 26%, uh, one quarter of the Jewish respondents said that they don't trust uh, the uh, results that are published by uh, the government. And amongst the Arabs, it was even higher, one third. Uh, this is a major blow uh, in terms of uh, the trust in, in the democratic system in Israel. And uh, the question is, uh, um, is anyone going to do anything about it in order either to explore the matter um, more deeply or uh, trying to take some moves in order to increase people's uh, faith in uh, uh, the published results? Because we know that in certain countries when people lose uh, confidence in, 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 in the uh, results, uh, things may deteriorate very quickly. Uh, we asked there, was it harder, uh, is it harder than in the past to decide whom to vote for? And as you can see, almost in all political camps, people said, yes, it is very, very difficult to decide who to vote for. It only tells you that the party identity is eroding very quickly. In Israel. Then we asked, uh, what are, were your uh, main consideration when choosing which party to vote for? And uh, as you can see, the socio-economic issues came first, then security, then equality within Israeli society, and, and most of the answers here uh, are related uh, uh, to equality within the Israeli Jewish society, not in the Israeli society in general. And if you take it together with the socioeconomic issues and gaps, you can see that uh, security comes second, but it comes second not because security is less important, but because people uh, assess uh, the current security situation as uh, being uh, um, um, as, as, as good and the IDF as being uh, capable of uh, uh, actually serving well the, the national security. The Iran issue uh, is not considered as an immediate threat and the Palestinians are uh, not thought of as uh, a, a real danger. And, and the idea of a third intifada is, is not thought of, uh, I don't have it here in order to show you, it is not thought of as something uh, realistic to happen in, in the near future. Then, uh, as you can see, and this is something that uh, is, is very important to understand, only 7% said that promoting settlement with the Palestinians is one of the main considerations when choosing which party to vote for. Actually, the issue of uh, uh, peace with the Palestinians was, was totally absent of uh, the past elections. And uh, if unless something very, very dramatic happens, it is not very likely to change its uh, uh, very marginal place in the next uh, elections. 
Now, uh, best choice for uh, a prime minister. Uh, this is uh, a week ago, a week and a half ago. Netanyahu comes first with around 40% saying that uh, they prefer him as a prime minister. Gantz, 24%. Uh, Barack, only 9%. Someone else from Likud, 5% and don't know 23%, but uh, uh, the difference between Netanyahu and Gantz uh, tells you that the fact that these two parties uh, are likely to get very similar seats in, uh, in the Knesset doesn't mean that the two leaders are standing on equal footing in terms of people preference for uh, a prime uh, minister. Now, how uh, healthy is uh, Israeli democracy? Well, one question that we repeat every uh, every year is, uh, is the regime in Israel democratic for Arab citizens uh, as well? As you can see amongst the Jews, there is a very strong majority saying, yes, it is democratic as, uh, for uh, the Arabs. However, amongst the Arabs, uh, the majority, not a very large majority, but the majority says that they disagree with this uh, statement. It only shows you that these two groups, the majority group and the minority group, they don't see things uh, uh, from a, a similar perspective. And of course, uh, this is also one of the reasons why uh, many Arabs do not want to take any part in the political life uh, in Israel. Now, this is a very, very uh, uh, problematic question. Uh, it's problematic because of the results, not because of the question. Uh, we asked whether Arabs who feel part of the Palestinian nation can or cannot also be loyal Israeli citizens. As you can see amongst the Arabs here, the majority think that uh, it is possible. Uh, uh, the, the Jews think uh, otherwise. Now, uh, here we come to the question of uh, the nation state uh, and the nation state law. We asked, Israel has the right to be defined as the nation state for the Jewish, pub, uh, the Jewish people. These are the results for the Arabs. The majority disagree with the definition of Israel as the nation state for the Jewish people. They aspire uh, of having uh, a state of all its citizens. And this is why actually uh, uh, some parties and some uh, people in the Knesset thought that it is uh, very critical to have a nation state law. Okay, but this is kind of a vicious circle. The more uh, the Arabs say that this uh, that Israel uh, does not have the right to be defined as the nation state for the Jewish people. The Jewish majority insists of uh, uh, making it quite clear whose uh, state uh, it is. And this is the main rock of contention actually between the majority group and the minority group uh, uh, in Israel. Um, and things are not getting any better in this, in, in this regard. Uh, I should mention here that when it has to do with only money and budgets, uh, Israeli Jews are uh, highly willing uh, of giving the Arabs uh, whatever they need in order to have a good um, education system, good health system, good, uh, you know, everything, roads and whatever. But when it comes to uh, the desire of the Arabs to take part in strategic policy making processes, then uh, the majority of uh, uh, the Jewish public says no. Uh, we got over 60% time and again of uh, uh, Jews refusing uh, to have uh, uh, the Arab parties as partners to the coalition and uh, of having uh, Arab ministers. So uh, the issue is not sharing resources. Uh, uh, the only resource that uh, Israeli Jews are unwilling to share is uh, uh, actually political power over the decision-making uh, 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 processes in Israel. And from the democratic point of view, it is even, of course, more severe than the money issue. 
Okay, because they are actually saying we have now uh, the number of uh, uh, Arabs 18 and above are around, is around 16%, but in general, I mean, taking everyone, it is 21 to 22%. So one fifth of the population is thought by the uh, majority group as unqualified or uh, as having no right of taking part in the most critical uh, political uh, 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 processes. Now, um, there was a book published recently that compared the answers to this question. Is it important that your country uh, has a democratic regime and particularly among young people in Europe mainly, but also in the United States, there was a decline in the people who supported democracy uh, as, as as uh, the most favorable uh, regime in Israel. We didn't find this in Israel. We asked this question uh, a couple of weeks ago. Amongst the Jews, we had 88% saying uh, it's important. Of course, the left more than the right. Amongst the Arabs, we always find, not only in Israel, but uh, in, in neighboring countries as well, they are less fascinated with the idea of democratic regime, mainly because they don't see it as a very effective regime. But when we uh, segmented things by age, then we found out that the younger, youngest age cohorts, between 18 to, to 34 uh, of the right, we had over 20% uh, answering in the negative, disagreeing with that. So uh, amongst the right and mainly uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the hardliners uh, of the right, uh, there are some signs that the uh, democratic model is not their uh, preferred model. Uh, and as uh, being on, on, on the hardcore right correlates in Israel uh, very, very strongly, almost like in physics, with being orthodox or ultra-orthodox, then their alternative to a democratic regime is uh, some kind of a theocracy or, or uh, some kind of a religious uh, state. Then we asked about the efficacy of democracy, and again, uh, uh, the same picture, the majority thinks that it's a good system for running a country. Now, uh, there are uh, certain media channels and uh, 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 people who, who think that uh, Israeli democracy is going down the drain. And we ask, is the Israeli democracy in a grave danger? He see the numbers by political blocks. 75% of those putting themselves on the left are uh, uh, afraid that indeed the Israeli democracy is uh, uh, in a very bad uh, uh, situation. Half of the people uh, in the center think this way, and if Netanyahu is replaced, uh, the number will decrease, but only one quarter of the right, I remind you, it's about, the right is about 60% of the Israeli uh, public now, only one quarter think that there is any problem with the Israeli democracy. So there is no consensus uh, in Israel between the uh, various political blocs, to which extent uh, uh, Israeli democracy is really threatened by the moves done in, uh, 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 recently by, by the government and so on and so forth. Future of democracy in Israel, the right uh, is um, uh, very uh, hopeful, uh, almost 70%, over two thirds are optimistic center, one third and left, less than one uh, uh, third, so as we can see, the right is pretty satisfied with the situation. This only tells you that they are very likely to vote for a right-wing party as well. Now to our last issue, Israel and the Palestinians, support for the two-state solution, impact of agreement, chances, uh, uh, success chances of the Trump peace plan, okay? So support for uh, uh, the two states, um, uh, by religious observers, as you can see, uh, the secular are uh, on top. They uh, are more supportive of uh, uh, the two-state solution, whereas the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox are uh, not uh, supportive uh, at all. 
but uh, you should also uh, uh, take into consideration the fact that this almost 70 percent when you ask them how realistic it is that we are going to have a two-state solution the number of those believing that this is a realistic option drops to about one third only and if uh, people do not believe that something that they desire for is not realistic they normally act upon their uh, assessment rather than uh, their uh, uh, aspiration. Two-state solution by age. As you can see, the, uh, uh, the younger age cohort is uh, uh, the less supportive of the two-state solution. And this is also explained by the fact that many of them are orthodox and ultra-orthodox, and they are located politically on uh, uh, the right. Got stuck some for whatever reason. Now, uh, what will happen if we are going to have a peace agreement? Uh, uh, we can see that there are differences of opinion to which extent uh, this is going to improve Israel's international status. Uh, on the left, almost everyone believes that this will do good to Israel's international status center also share, uh, although to a lesser extent, but on the right, the, the issue of the international status as an outcome of uh, uh, the signing of a peace agreement, less than a half think that this will improve uh, Israel's uh, international status. Amongst the Arabs, uh, almost 70% think that this would help Israel uh, in, in having a good international reputation. Now, chances of uh, Trump plan, um, as you can see, the reds, you don't even have to read the numbers. Uh, almost everyone, Jews and Arabs in Israel, do not have uh, almost any expectation that this uh, would lead uh, uh, to peace. Of course, uh, there is a difference between the left, center, and right, but the differences are minor and my last slide before we get to the questions uh, uh your question uh, do you support the idea of economic peace as you can see amongst the the jews there is a, a, a significant majority saying yes economic peace is a good idea i should remind you that the uh, issue of economic peace was uh, uh, raised in the past by netanyahu as an alternative to uh, any, any agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. He said, if we'll give them money and good life, uh, they will give up at least uh, in the foreseeable future on their national aspiration uh, of having a sovereign state. Uh, amongst the Arabs, uh, uh, the picture is totally different. Only one third support the idea of um, of uh, an economic peace, one third is against, and almost 30% have uh, uh, no opinion about it. So this is it, and uh, I'll welcome any questions you may have. Great, so thank you so much, Tamar, and that was really, really informative and an excellent presentation. Um, so we're gonna move into questions. I'm just gonna start off with one question of my own, and then uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience. If you want to ask a question, um, you can submit questions through the Q&A box uh, by typing them there, and that box is at the bottom of your screen, or you can type them into the chat also at the bottom, um, and we'll select some of the questions from there for tomorrow to answer. So um, my question was about the findings in this latest Israeli voice index. Um, we saw um, some declining optimism about democracy um, and declining optimism about national security. How do you square those statistics with the idea that the majority of people think the overall situation in Israel is good or even very good? I would say that the decline is the result of, of the ambiguity uh, that people are experiencing right now. Because what I see is people of, uh, 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 of very prominent status, like Ehud Barak, for example, telling them that Netanyahu is incapable of dealing with security, certainly with not, not with the, uh, the uh, democratic system in Israel, 
And of course, the other way around, uh, 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 leaders of the right are warning people that if they will opt for another option, then uh, uh, security will be given to people who are not responsible enough or not uh, uh, having enough experience. Uh, so uh, they are being bombarded with some, uh, with only, I would say, only negative messages. There is nothing positive in what they hear. People, uh, sometimes you have a political rival and they give, you give them respect even if you challenge their views. This is not the case right now in Israel. It is all personal, it is all negative. So people are losing their foothold. They actually don't know uh, uh, what to think about the future because they don't know who is going to be the next leader and uh, what kind of an agenda will uh, direct the, the, the next four years or, or two years or three years, depending on what is going to happen. So it's negativity that makes them uh, less, uh, less optimistic. However, they live good life. Economy is very good in Israel. Uh, security is uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, in good hands, uh, besides the South, of course, uh, which is also, um, uh, uh, a minefield for both sides because each one blames the other for uh, the deterioration there, uh, and uh, um, so uh, they they are in a, in a kind of a cognitive dissonance because they live good lives. Uh, um, I don't know if any of you visited Tel Aviv in recent years. It's impossible to get a seat uh, on Friday evening in any of the good restaurants. People are going on vacations very often. People are buying new cars all the time. Uh, uh, jobs, unemployment is very, very low. So basically, life is good. And, and, and therefore, they, they find it very, very difficult to deal with this uh, 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 contradiction between what they feel and what they hear and what they sense and what they expect. Great. Um, so it was, uh, so we have some other questions from the audience now. Um, so we have two questions I'm going to sort of bring together. Um, one is from uh, Harry Reese asking about what the time frame of these uh, results and the survey taking was. Um, and we also have a question about how Netanyahu's legal troubles impact these results. Um, and I would just note for the audience that this was released uh, two days ago, this latest Israeli voice index. So um, in terms of when you were asking the question, what was the time, questions, what was the timeline for that? And right. were people oh. receiving it alongside the news about Netanyahu's own uh, corruption scandals? Okay, uh, uh, all surveys that were presented here uh, were conducted after February, 2018. So two uh, months before the elections and two months after the elections. The time span is four and a half months. Uh, as to the corruption issue, um, well, uh, basically the left uh, uh, puts much emphasis on it and the center even more because the center uh, says openly, blue and white leaders are saying openly that they are willing to have a unity. Uh, they are actually wishing to have uh, uh, a unity government with Likud uh, if Netanyahu goes. So uh, both center and left are highlighting the, uh, uh, the corruption issue, whereas on, on the right, uh, the perception is that actually the corruption uh, allegations are used in order to uh, topple Netanyahu and the, the judiciary system, uh, judicial system is actually serving some uh, political agenda that cannot be served by the election. So uh, they see the entire thing as, and, and the hesitations by uh, uh, the pop top people uh, in, in, in the judiciary, uh, they, they uh, uh, say that uh, they are trying to use uh, the courts in order to pull the rug from under the feet of the elections. Uh, 
uh, they do not see it as corruption per se, uh, they see it as petty things. Uh, was the situation with the, submarine di the submarines different than maybe more people of the right uh, would have been convinced that we are talking real corruption? But uh, as Netanyahu is always talking about, you know, some hot meals taken from some restaurants and some cigars and some whiskey, uh, he, he manages to really reduce it to something which might be uh, undone legally, but not really something that uh, prevents him from being a very good uh, uh, prime minister. This is the way that it is being perceived by, by many of them. And also the fact that uh, so many people of the right were taken to court in recent years because of uh, corruption. It is again being perceived as a political weapon by people belonging to what Netanyahu tends to refer to as the old elites who do not like him, the Ashkenazi uh, with the higher education, secular, state of Tel Aviv, this notion that is being very often used by, by him. And, and, and of course, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is uh, perceived as the, the main bastion of liberalism in Israel. And they see it as a political agenda, not as uh, uh, an ideology detached from day-to-day uh, uh, -day politics. So now we have um, another question, um, this one about political ideology from Stephen, asking how uh, and to what extent Jewish Israeli voters switch from the different political blocks and move from left to right or right to left, or are people relatively static in where they are? They hardly move to right, uh, from right to left or left to, to right ever. They move from one party, it's an intra-camp or intra-block uh, movement, not between blocks. And this is because people's affiliation with left or right, less so center, is strongly correlated with some social demographic characteristics such as level of religiosity, uh, ethnic descent, uh, uh, place of residence, center or periphery, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I always give this example uh, in many synagogues uh, in, in Israel, mainly in, in the settlements in the West Bank. It's actually socially impossible to identify yourself with, uh, with the left. And in the cafeteria of Tel Aviv University Social Science uh, Building, it's almost uh, uh, impossible to identify yourself with the right. So people are so much uh, uh, committed to uh, a specific political block because of the background and friends and uh, community pressures are very, very strong in Israel because it is a very intimate society, not necessarily for the better. Uh, so even if people change their mind, crossing the lines would cost them dearly in terms of social sanctions that will be put on them. And therefore, they, they move within the block, but they don't move almost ever between the blocks. Now we have a question from Merrily uh, asking about uh, movement and shifts in the results for the different political parties in the upcoming elections as compared to what happened in April. Um, the current graphs and what you were showing, there's a small drop off from Likud and from the blue and white party. But other than that, it doesn't seem that any party has been punished for having a second election or, or having some kind of severe drop off in their result from the last one. What accounts for that? You, you are absolutely right. The shifts are, are quite minimal. The only one that really gained something out of it is Lieberman's and Israel Beitenu, who doubled, almost doubled uh, by the surveys again. So now the question is, uh, uh, are the, and, and people were fascinated mainly with his uh, anti-ultra-orthodox rhetoric because uh, there are many people in Israel who are very, very upset 
uh, with the uh, demands put forward by the ultra-orthodox parties uh, after the elections. They got more seats than they had previously, and the demands that they put were, were quite uh, far-reaching. So people of the right actually moved away from Likud, who is cooperating with the ultra-orthodox, and uh, they now favor Lieberman. But again, it is within the bloc. It is not between the bloc. And, and by the way, the Arabs, for example, sided with Netanyahu when he uh, actually suggested that we uh, will have uh, uh, new elections because they wanted to create again the joint uh, list rather than run in, in, in two parties. So it looked very paradoxical that uh, uh, many parties thought that this may give them a second chance because they were dissatisfied with the results of the April uh, elections. Right, there, there was that uh, uh, severe drop off in the Arab turnout and this was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and the other issues with the breakup of the joint list, as you mentioned, so this was an opportunity to mm -hmm. go back on that. So we have two more questions um, I'm going to put forward. Um, one is from Howard Sumka about uh, the issues that people prioritize. Um, if people are prioritizing, or plur uh, plurality of voters are prioritizing economic issues, what accounts for the popularity of Netanyahu um, and the right um, in Israeli politics? Um, why don't uh, more people support uh, parties that have uh, more left-wing uh, attitudes towards economic issues? Um, how does that square with the amount of people who see security as a primary issue or the Palestinians as a primary issue? Um, and then the other question that we have um, is with all of these things that we're looking at, uh, possible decline in um, democratic norms and democracy, um, interest sliding away from the Palestinian issue, um, and, and all of the attendant threats with that, how should American Jews uh, be reacting to that? Okay, I'll try and, and, and answer, although about the American Jews, uh, I feel less, uh, less confident in my, in my answer. The first question about the economic issue and why people are voting for the right, um, it's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting question that many of us uh, I've been dealing with it, but we, we bring with us uh, uh, the idea that it's uh, all uh, about the economy, okay? Those voting for the right are not doing it because of the economic issue. This is the main concern of them, but they vote for the right because it, uh, it emphasizes the Jewish identity of the state. So people of lesser uh, wealth, uh, people of the periphery, people who could have gained more uh, if the uh, social democratic agenda of the left uh, was uh, the state uh, uh, agenda, um, they uh, say uh, that the economic issue is important, but the Jewish identity is more important. And they say that the, those uh, people on the right uh, do not uh, respect uh, the, the uh, Jewishness of the state because they side with the Arabs uh, on many issues and so on and so forth. And also it's all about the messenger because uh, the politicians, the leaders of, of the left, they come from uh, uh, these old elites that I already mentioned and uh, they uh, do not uh, succeed in uh, convincing uh, the more needy sectors of Israeli society that they are sincere in their concern for their well-being. They think that uh, these people uh, that are much more uh, wealthy and educated and live in better places, uh, when they say that they care for us, they don't really care for us. They just want our votes in order to uh, um, to realize their agenda, which is universalist, liberal, pro-Arab, and whatever. They just don't buy uh, um, the agenda of the left because of the messengers. Okay? 
as for uh, the decline in democratic uh, uh, values and so on and so forth, this is the uh, interpretation of people uh, in the center and on the left. On the right, people do not think that uh, uh, there is a deterioration in the democratic uh, values. They actually think that in a way, the democratic uh, uh, system was hijacked in the past by the left and, and center left, and that they actually messed up things. Uh, for example, in choosing the judges of the Supreme Court uh, and on many other issues, they think that what they do, and this is what, for example, Ayelet Shaked, Minister of Justice, repeatedly said in recent years, they are now making corrections to a democratic uh, system that was abused by, uh, by the liberals. In this respect, in, Several years ago, we didn't have this notion of liberalism as something negative. This is something that was imported to Israel from the United States. Okay, uh, uh, being liberal it, 10 years ago in Israel did not stigmatize you negatively in any way. So uh, in a way, what they are aspiring for in their view, of course, is to really uh, improve the democratic system of Israel. There is no consensus that uh, uh, the, the uh, democratic uh, uh, character of Israel is, is uh, deteriorating. So uh, we, we should listen to that in order to understand that there is no consensus over something that you, you uh, stated as effective. And, uh, they don't think that there is a deterioration. This is something that people of other views are, are, are uh, uh, believing. As for the American Jews, well, this is a, a very complicated uh, uh, question because uh, the question is to which extent people who are not citizens of, of a state should interfere or intervene in, in domestic policies. Um, I suppose that uh, giving some support to the views uh, uh, or, or to parties which people uh, from the United States like, uh, this is something that uh, can be done, but uh, uh, at which point this will be interpreted as uh, uh, undesired or even illegal interference, uh, it's, it's problematic. Uh, we know it uh, firsthand because uh, uh, the IDI is uh, supported for many years by uh, a very generous American donor. And whenever people want to delegitimize us, they say, uh, this is American money. The same goes for the NGOs and many civil society organizations and parties of the left that enjoy budgets coming from the EU. Uh, so uh, external uh, interference is something or involvement, even with the best, uh, with the best intentions, uh, may sometimes boomerang. Last but not least, all we hear here, uh, or many people who are not uh, into uh, uh, political science and into reading uh, uh, American uh, um, newspapers or media, all we hear is that uh, the American Jews are not with us anymore anyhow, and that the younger age cohort uh, uh, do not, uh, are not interested in Israel and certainly do not support it anymore. Peter Beinart, for example, uh, all his uh, uh, um, articles are being widely disseminated here and people are saying, okay, if they don't support us, uh, uh, we'll have to make do uh, by ourselves. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the situation, I'm just telling you what people are thinking, or certain people are thinking. And it's certainly a very delicate line to walk uh, on that issue. Um, so. Thank you, Professor Herman, for, for your really valuable insights. And I also want to thank URJ for partnering with us on this important endeavor. Um, we're going to be sending out more details about upcoming programs on July 25th and August 6th. Um, so be on the lookout for more of these. Um, I also encourage everyone to follow Israel Policy Forum's 120 project at www.israelpolicyforum.org 
forward slash elections two. That's number two for videos, podcasts, elections analysis, polling data, and other resources like this to help you keep up with developments leading up to the election. And now I want to hand it off to Rabbi Josh Weinberg from yeah. URJ. Uh, thank you, Evan, so much. And uh, of course, thanks go out to Professor Herman for giving us such a comprehensive and in-depth explanation and uh, presentation. Uh, I want to thank IPF for doing this with us together. I think this is a, an incredible opportunity for us to be able to get an inside view of what's happening in Israel, uh, for those of us who, of course, are paying attention uh, always, and to be able to share with our communities and our congregations uh, some of the updated uh, analyses and, uh, and understandings of uh, how things are unfolding. Um, of course, that, uh, that, that the presentation will be available to you. And of course, we just need to uh, accredit Professor Herman and the Israel Democracy Institute if you use any of the information that you heard here today. I really want to encourage you to join us for the next set, uh, the, the whole series of the next set of webinars on July 25th, August 6th, and into September. As I, I can assure you of one thing, that everything that we talked about today is likely to change in the coming future as we near the elections. Um, we'll be interested to see what political parties merge and who comes together and coalesces, and of course, uh, what are some of the interesting things and <laughs> that the Prime Minister might still yet have up his sleeve uh, that we can uh, not predict just yet. So thanks again to, to Evan and to all of our friends at IPF and of course to Professor Herman, and thank you all for participating and joining in with us today. Shalom. Thank Great, you. thanks, and, and we'll, we'll see you all next time on July 25th.